Hello and a very warm welcome to today's panel discussion on careers in aviation. I'm Paul Wyborn, Senior Flight Instructor in the Associate Degree in Aviation at RMIT University. Before we start today's session, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Woi Warang and Boon Warang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. And while we conduct our work remotely, I want to pay my respect to the wider unceded lands of this nation. Let's start with the introduction. The aviation industry is a vast and impacts many different sectors. It covers military, civil and general aviation and all the enabling infrastructure, including airports and air traffic control. The largest sector, civil aviation, connects people, goods and countries and is recognised as playing a vital role in both economic and social development. In 2019, commercial airlines logged over 45 million flights and carried over 4.5 billion passengers. That's more than half the world's population. This was made possible by approximately 5,000 airlines operating 25,000 civil aircraft over a global route network of several million square kilometres. Well, I hope that's enough motivation for you to get involved in this exciting industry through RMIT's Associate Degree in Aviation program. Before we get into it, let's watch a short video to set the mood for today's session. It's an experience that really can't be replicated. Sliding into the pilot seat for the first time, the crackle and hum of the cockpit's intercom, reviewing the flight plan one final time before kicking the tires, lighting the fires, and feeling the plane peel away from the earth. The temperature dropping as you climb, watching homes, rivers and highways shrink from view until you're up among the clouds. It's anything but your standard nine to five flying. Whether it's a long haul over the red deserts of central Australia or landing a ski plane on an Alaskan glacier, flying opens up a world of opportunities. If you're lucky, you'll catch a glimpse of the Earth's shadow at dusk as the sun sets in the opposite direction while you navigate the rivers of wind in the sky and catch a tailwind that speeds you towards your destination. So, are you ready to take on what's next in aviation? Then step onto the tarmac and launch your career with RMIT. Okay. Well, on today's Q&A panel, we'll be talking about a range of topics relating to the associate degree. First, let's meet the members of our panel today. We have Verinda or Vinnie Sohi. Vinnie has a Master of Aviation Industry Management and has been teaching at RMIT since 2014. He's passionate about stu uh, the student experience and new technologies in learning and teaching. We also have Jacinta Burgess. Jacinta is a former student of RMIT starting in the associate degree in early 2017. Jacinta graduated in 2019 and is now employed by RMIT flight training as an instructor. Aviation is Jacinta's passion and in her words, I love teaching new generations of pilots how to fly and follow their dreams. We also have Katia Vasta. Katia is a current student at RMIT undertaking the associate degree in aviation. Katia will talk more about her experience with the program later in this discussion. And of course, there's me, I'm Paul Wyborn, and I'll be your MC on today's panel. I'm a grade one flying instructor at RMIT flight training at Point Cook. I'm also a flight examiner and I love seeing students passing their flight tests. You can see the excitement in their eyes and how proud they are when they reach a milestone and achieve their goals. And this is one of the true reward, rewards in my job as a flight examiner. OK, well, first of all, just before we start, I'd like to remind our viewers out there that we'll all um, have 15 minutes at the end of our panel dis discussion to go over any questions from the audience. Uh, you can submit questions in the Q&A tool on the right hand side of your screen at any time and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. You can also download a presentation on our flight training course by clicking the link in the Q&A chat. All right, well, let's start off with the first question now, and this question goes to Jacinta. Jacinta, flight training at RMIT is carried out at multiple locations. Can you tell us a bit more about each of them? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so RMIT, we're privileged enough to have three locations and I'm going to go through them in a bit more detail now. So our first location is our Point Cook location. Um, on the RAF um, Williams base. Um, we're lucky enough to have access to this and it's an exclusive access as well. Um, just to give a little bit more background into it, it is the oldest operating Air Force base in the world. So it does have quite a lot of history behind it as well. Um, where we are located in Point Cook as well, we have access to various controlled airspace and you'll find that our training area in Point Cook actually goes to the Avalon um, training area or airspace. So we had a wide variety going back and forth there. Um, it is a secure and safe training environment for all students. Um, so being on a base as well, um, we obviously get issued base passes. We've got privileged access as well. Um, it is quite close to the Melbourne CBD. Um, it's only 30 minutes away. Um, and by aircraft, you can actually fly over it pretty easily too. Um, our next one, it's one of our newer campuses. Um, it's up in Bendigo. Um, Bendigo is located six kilometres from the central um, location of Bendigo and 160 kilometres from Melbourne CBD. So you'd have either option of doing Point Cook or Bendigo. Um, Bendigo um, offers a brand new runway. They've just resurfaced it um, and modern training facilities as well. So obviously being quite a new campus up in Bendigo, we've just um, established modern facilities there. Um, training routes can include both regional and rural airstrips and some include Swan Hill, Mildura, Shepparton, Horsham and we can also go into the Riverina into New South Wales. That gives us a bit more opportunity to go further in places. Uh, our last campus is our Adelaide campus um, and this is via a third party provider um, and they're called Hartwick Airflight. So they're still using all the same RMIT products, it's just delivered through Hartwick Air. Um, it is accessed on Parafield Airport, um, a little bit of a big, bigger airport compared to what we have in Bendigo and Point Cook. Um, and it's also easy rail access to the city. So these are all great locations that you can all train at. Um, looking at our fleet now, so we have um, exclusive use of modern um, flight training aircraft and we have newly acquired Cessna 172 with glass cockpits. The 172s are what you'll start your initial training with, um, so your RPL through to your PPL um, or private pilot's license. Once you progress to your commercial pilot's license, you'll upgrade it in aircraft a little bit and you'll go to our 182 aircraft. Um, once you start your instrument training, um, if you wish to go down that path, um, we have two seminars um, that are available for you to use. Uh, we also have a super decathlon as well, and that's used for aerobatic um, and also tailwheel. Um, just briefly about our instructors as well. So some, most of our instructors are alumni of the course um, and they know exactly what it's like to be flight training student at RMIT. I'm an alumni as well. I graduated from RMIT and now a flight instructor. So I draw on this experience um, from being a student and so do many others around here as well. Um, we have 25 flying instructors and they range from senior grade one to from Paul and then to junior grade threes as well. Um, and this is across our two campuses, both Point Cook and Bendigo. Great, thanks um, Jacinta. Wow, um, aerobatics, that sounds uh, pretty exciting. Um, turning to Katia, um, can you tell us a bit about your training location? Uh, yep, so the Point Cook airfield is located along Port Phillip Bay just east of the Avalon Airport. We are lucky to be surrounded by a beautiful scenic area, such as the beach, wetlands, and the city skyline, which provide great views when flying. Um, as the main users of Point Cook airspace, there's min minimal congestion and therefore fewer delays in the circuit and surrounding airspace. This allows for greater flight time and improved training efficiency. We also have access to all types of airspace and weather conditions created by the surrounding mountains, the sea and the city. So we were able to learn in a variety of conditions benefiting our training and allowing us to graduate with job ready skills. Okay, thanks very much Katia. Um, the next uh, question uh, goes to you Vinny. How is the course structured and uh, when can you expect to do your first solo flight as a student? Sure, thank you Paul. Um, <clears throat> So the associate degree is a two-year program. Um, it comprises of four semesters. You've got, at this first semester, you've got an RPL, which is a recreation pilot license, um, very basic level training. Uh, then you move into a private pilot license in your second semester, 
followed by your commercial pilot license in the third. And then in the final semester, you get a choice between an instructor rating or an instrument rating. Um, so during each semester, you've got about two days of theory and about three days of flying. So as you can see, it's a pretty intense five day course. Um, the flying can starts as early as 7 a.m. in the morning and the last flight being at 8 or 9 at night, depending when you do night circuits. And as for your solos, you can be expecting to go, sorry, as for your first flight, you can be expecting to go into your first flight within the first two weeks of the course and going on your first solo in about five to six weeks into your training. Okay, thanks very much, um, Vinny. That sounds um, that sounds like a pretty uh, busy program. Um, and Jacinta, I think you're probably best placed to answer the next question. What kind of time commitment would be required to fit all of that into two years? Yeah, awesome question, Paul. So the students are quite busy. Um, they're obviously committed to a full time course. Um, like Vinny said, it is a five day commitment. Um, we're actually lucky enough to be operating now um, seven days. So we're open Monday to Sunday. Um, and as a result of that, we have been able to give the students more flying days. So if they're available, they can fly on both Saturday and Sunday as well. Um, you would be expected to be flying on your flying days during the week. Um, most students have two flying days per week and then theory during the rest. If you're available on those weekends, you can grab in, come in and grab an extra flight um, if you're available then. Um, like Vinny said as well, it is split between flying only days and theory only days. So while you're um, in here in Point Cook on campus, it'll only be flying. Um, so you're pretty much free all day, do your flight, prepare for your flight, all that kind of stuff. Um, while we go around for theory then, um, you'd be doing your theory only days. Okay, thanks very much, Jacinta. Um, wow, um, <laughs> Katia, with, with such a busy schedule, obviously a, as a student, are students able to hold part-time jobs? Um, yes, as long as it is flexible with hours, um, you can have a job alongside the course. However, you must be able to commit to the two to three flying days a week, combined with the scheduled theory classes, which could be two, one to two days a week. Okay, thanks very much, um, Katia. All right, well, the next question I'm going to pose to uh, Vinny. Uh, what, pre sorry, what prerequisites are required for someone who is considering this course? A very relevant question, Paul. So basically the associate degree has a pre-entry pre, uh, requirements of an ATA. So if you're going through your VC right now, uh, we require a 50.5 ATA. But do note that that goes up and down a little bit every year. So the latest guys should be coming out with the, the new ATAs. We also require a minimum of English and maths. So a 25 in English and a 20 in maths. Uh, it could be any maths. It could be methods, further or specialist. Um, there aren't any real age restrictions on the program. Um, it's really open to all ages. Uh, but we do require a medical. So you have to sit a uh, aviation medical and get cleared from a DAMI, which is a designated aviation medical examiner, um, just to make sure that you're fit to fly um, and that you can hold down a, a pilot license. Um, and yeah. Okay, all right, thanks very much, um, Vinny. And um, the I know that the list of um, designated aviation medical examiners or DAMIs, as Vinny mentioned, can be found on the CASA um, website. That's um, Civil Aviation's website online. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next question, which is for you, Jacinta. Can you give us an idea of how our students learn to fly or learn how to fly and what tools do you use? Yeah, absolutely. So here at RMIT, we believe um, that real world learning is the best way to go about learning. Um, so we do that by putting our students in the aircraft relatively quickly. Um, like Vinnie mentioned before, they can expect their first flight within the first two weeks that they're at RMIT. Um, so basically, we give them a rundown of the operations um, surrounding RMIT, how we work, um, how the aircraft work and all that kind of stuff. They'll also then go theory for a couple of days and then they'll be able to hop into an aircraft and have their real world experience at flying an aircraft. Um, obviously, we get them in the 172 first, like I mentioned before, um, a little bit smaller compared to the 182. Um, that's our first training aircraft that we use. Um, also, being COVID at the moment, um, they're also now in remote learning 
Um, remote theory as well. It's very accessible though. It can be used at any time. It is um, pre-recorded, or not pre-recorded, it's live, but it is recorded. So students can go back and access it at any time if they need to, um, which makes it really, really easy um, to look at at any time they need to learn something else, improve on their learning, anything like that. But that's pretty much how we teach our students to fly, get them straight into the aircraft as soon as possible. Wow, that sounds um, that sounds pretty pretty exciting. You um, with within only a couple of weeks, you're going to be in an aircraft. Okay, um, and and that sounds you know with with a lot of these things moving on to, into the remote environment, I guess that means you can be anywhere in the world at any time of the day to be able to access uh, all of these um, learning materials. So um, that leads me on to the next question um, for you, Vinny. Has COVID-19 brought about any innovations in these delivery methods and um, has it changed the way students learn? Thank you, Paul. Uh, indeed, COVID has changed a lot of aspects of business and certainly flight training as well. So during our lockdowns last year, um, we had a very dynamic and flexible team that was able to pivot and get all the content that we traditionally delivered face-to-face -face into an online environment. Now, we didn't just go online and just deliver the same con the same context uh, online, but we did make sure that it was engaging. We ensured that the students were learning um, and also keeping a very close eye on the fact that they were spending a lot of time in front of the screens. So overall, we've had a significant change in the way we were delivering our theory, just to make sure that we're covering all the bases in COVID. Um, that's also allowed us to accelerate the theory, which means when the the lockdowns do end, um, the students do return to campus, they can then purely focus on the flying and catch up. Um, and yeah, we've got a pretty good suit of courses now that can be delivered online. Okay, thanks very much, um, Vinny. And I suppose um, the next question would be relevant for you, Katia, because um, from a student's perspective, how do these delivery methods support or enhance your learning? Oh, yeah. So having a wide variety of delivery methods allows us students to get the most out of our learning. Like Jacinta said, the online components provide resources to help complete study at home, while also having the benefit um, of being able to rewatch lectures and take extra notes if it was missed in class or just to go over things. There, um, where the face-to-face -face components provide high quality teaching when on campus that can be regularly accessed and put into practice while on campus. Thanks, Katia. Well, staying with you, um, Katia, have you always wanted to study flight training and tell us why? Yes, yeah, so I'm pretty sure most people would say that being a pilot has either once or has always been a dream of theirs. And for me, that is also so true. I was lucky enough to have many friends whose parents were pilots, which sparked my interest quite early on. And having a few hours experience flying planes before I started uni at RMIT made me love it even more. I was also the recipient of um, a free flight at one of the open days that RMIT provided. And I got to experience what it was like actually learning how to fly with an instructor from RMIT. And I just, it made me love it even more as well. Okay, thank you. Wow, that's exciting. You got, got a uh, free flight um, care of the university. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, can you share with us, uh, where are you up to in the associate degree and what are you enjoying most about the course? Uh, yeah, so I'm up to my recreational pilot's license test um, and straight after I complete that I'll be moving on to the private pilot's license training. Um, I'm really enjoying how fast paced the course is, keeping me on my toes um, and always staying up to date and informed on the theory is what makes it more interesting and I just love the flying. Thanks for that. Um, have you um... Have you already taken up your first solo flight? Yes, yes. You have? Okay, could you share with um, with our, our audience today what that was like? Definitely nerve-wracking at the start. Um, <laughs> just being alone in the plane, I just had to rely on what I was taught. And while I was taxiing to the runway, it was always like, am I doing this right? But as soon as I took off, it was... It was the best thing ever and probably one of my best landings as well. So it's pretty stoked about that. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. That's great to hear. Thanks very much, um, Katia. Uh, all right, let's uh, turn to Vinny for the next question. Um, Vinny, can you tell us about RMIT's relationship with Qantas Link and the Qantas Future Pilot Program? Yeah, sure, Paul. So the Qantas Future Pilot Program is a relatively new initiative um, that Qantas has taken. Uh, they're looking at uh, the grassroots. So RMIT has been fortunate enough to be partnered with Qantas Link. Um, we basically, once a student who, who is successful can go into the Qantas Future Pilot Program stream, you get to train on the Q400s and the Q300 turboprops. Um, so the Qantas Future Pilot Program is basically split into three phases. The student must success, be successful in each stage to move into the next. Um, so typically stage one is open to students uh, who are in the second year of their associate degree. So that's the students who will be looking at their commercial pilot license. Uh, while you're being registered as a candidate in the QFPP program, you're not guaranteed a job, um, but it still is a really good experience because you will get mentoring and seminars that are straight from industry. Um, and it gives Qantas unique access to highly qualified industry ready professionals from RMIT. So I think really it is a win-win situation. Yeah, it sure is. And thanks very much um, for that, Vinny. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, we used to have a lot of the um, Qantas personnel come to us. Um, so students, we get to meet them in person um, where they would conduct seminars and mentoring sessions. Now, of course, a lot of that has moved online, but it still, uh, it still occurs throughout the students' um, studies with RMIT. And um, I, I remember um, one of the quotes, uh, which I think is a requote quote from um, uh, it was from the chief pilot of Qantas Link. Um, he said that is it's not your um, uh, it's not your aptitude which determines your altitude, but it is your attitude which determines your altitude. And I think that's a really great thing to remember for uh, for young players out there um, who are who are thinking about coming into aviation. If you have a really good attitude, then, you know, really that can take you uh, to a lot of places. Um, the Qantas, um, uh, the Qantas, our partnership with Qantas has been um, uh, in effect since about 2018. Um, so it's alive and well. Uh, we're now sort of three years into that partnership. Um, currently, um, phase two and three are closed. That's an operational um, requirement that Qantas have set, but um, phase one is still open to any um, RMIT uh, registered student or enrolled student. So it's a really a great opportunity for um, students to, uh, to you know, have that kind of access to, uh, to Qantas personnel. And, um, uh, and if I could just share one of the things that um, that sits within those phases, which is an assessment centre. Um, now, I, uh, what the assessment centre is, is they they bring um, successful candidates um, from the associate degree into an assessment centre and they basically um, tell you, they mentor you and they tell you how how to um, conduct yourself um, during an interview. Now, of course, them being the employer, that's a um, that's a very unique opportunity where an employer actually uh, approaches you and and basically tells you how to get through their own interview. I don't know of too many employers out there um, that that you have that kind of um, uh, that kind of exposure to. So yeah, again, a really good opportunity for um, uh, associate degree RMIT associate degree candidates um, to um, to get involved in this program. Uh, and maybe there might be a job opportunity at the end. OK, um, uh, the next question is going to Jacinta. Um, this is about career outcomes. So Jacinta, can you share with the audience um, what do career outcomes look like for graduating students? Yeah, absolutely. So in aviation, um, we're lucky enough that we have lots and lots of different career options. Um, even though I constantly get asked if I've been in the commercial airlines, that's not the only path that we can take. So I'm going to touch on my story a little bit um, about my graduating options when I graduated. So I went through, um, obviously, RMIT um, to do all my training. 
Uh, and then once I completed my training as a flight instructor, I was fortunate enough to get a job at RMIT as a junior grade three instructor. Um, now with a junior grade three, you're like a little baby in the company. Um, so as you progress, you get more and more opportunities that arise. Um, I'm now a grade two flight instructor, so I've had lots of opportunities along the way. Um, it's been a really, really rewarding career so far. Um, my career is obviously not going to stop here. Um, I'm still very young and I've still got lots of opportunities in front of me. Um, in the future, um, I'm planning on being an instructor for quite a while. I'm quite enjoying it. Um, as Paul said in the introduction, I love um, teaching students. I love seeing them go solo like Cardia. Um, love seeing their faces when they come back from a flight and saying, woo, I did it. So it's such a rewarding career. Um, in the future, I'm probably going to look at maybe charter airlines. Um, obviously a little bit more passenger related, that kind of stuff. Um, I obviously haven't done my instrument rating yet, so I went down the instructor rating path. There's two pathways that you can pretty much split off into. Um, I've chosen an instructor, um, but I can also stem back into the instrument rating. Um, with the instrument rating, um, you're not limited to it at all, but you can start doing like outback station flying. I know a lot of people um, from my year especially, they went um, up north and they're doing some outback flying. Um, you can also do tourism flights. Uh, again, I've seen people that have come straight out of university, um, gone up to Uluru, places like that, and done tourism flights around Uluru. Um, it's a great opportunity as well. Um, there is also global opportunities from um, obviously graduating from RMIT. Um, there was a female back a few years who's now in Vanuatu. Um, she's doing a charter airline, so that's a great opportunity for her as well. Um, obviously, there is a commercial airline stream that you can go down. Um, we are partnered with the QFPP program, um, so that's a great pathway to go down as well. You're also not limited to Defence Force as well. You can also apply for the Defence Force once you've graduated. Um, that's another stepping stone into that opportunity. Um, and also emergency services as well. Um, so we do have um, emergency services that come around, we fly, see them fly by. Um, so that might be another option for other people when they're graduating, going into those emergency services, especially if you want to help out someone. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty good opportunity to do that too. So that's just some of the pathways um, that you could take for graduating students. Of course, you're not limited to those, there's plenty more. Great, thanks. Um, thanks very much for sharing that insight, uh, Jacinta. Um, you, you mentioned um, that there are pathways into a number of um, a number of areas, including defence force. Now, being at a um, located at a defence base, do you, do you see many um, defence uh, flight or aerial activity going on? Yeah, sometimes actually we're pretty fortunate enough that sometimes the Globemaster comes in, um, the Hercules, um, they're obviously doing stuff with the Air Museum, dropping off stuff, so it's pretty cool when they come by. Um, King Air also comes by quite a bit, it's pretty cool when you're in the circuit and they're coming on the radio saying that they're inbound, um, obviously got to watch out for them, but it's pretty cool to be around when they're around too. Um, the other day we also had one of the roulettes come in. Um, that was pretty spectacular as well. Again, I was in the air when that happened. Um, it was really, really rewarding to see them flying in and around. So we do get quite a bit of exposure to military aircraft being on a military base. So it's quite a unique opportunity that we do actually have here at RMIT Point Cook campus. Great, that sounds exciting. And, and uh, do the students get to see all of that um, aerial activity like the roulettes? Yeah, absolutely. So they do, um, the roulettes sometimes do some practice routines over our airport. Um, we usually just stand on the grass outside and watch them do that. So it's kind of like a free air show, so to speak. So it's actually really fun. Um, back before COVID as well, the Air Museum used to do um, air display every Tuesday and Thursday um, and sometimes on Sunday. So that was actually pretty cool to just chill and watch them do their air display. Um, it's all aerobatic manoeuvres as well. So it's quite impressive what they do actually do. And of course, the students can have a look at that too. That's excellent. That sounds really exciting. Wow, a, a, a free air show. You don't get to see that every day. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Jacinta. Um, Vinny, this is your question. Um, everyone is aware of the impact that COVID-19 pandemic um, has had on the aviation industry. What's the forecast for recovery? Well, Paul, you've asked a question there, I think. Um, so 
it's really uh, um, it's really anyone's guess what's going to happen to the industry. But what I like to do is just go back in history and have a look at what's happened in the past when we've had you know events that have been outside anyone's control. So if you take your attention back to 9-11, um, which was directly an aviation-related incident, um, the industry went lost to all its demand and confidence. We had the global financial crisis not too long ago. Um, again, people were, there was low demand. There was talk about you know what's going to happen to the industry. So every time we've had something negative occur in the industry, the industry has been resilient and it's recovered. And dare I say, that's probably what's going to happen again this time around. So as we already have seen uh, from around different parts of the world, the, the, the market's starting to pick up. People are starting to wanting to fly again. Uh, as soon as we get on top of our vaccinations, I feel like the industry will recover. Um, so just another thing on that is that before COVID, there were two major problems in aviation, and namely they were aging pilots around the world, and we had a very strong aviation demand, which continued to grow every year. Now, COVID's come in, um, it's accelerated the first problem we had. So a lot of pilots have opted out for an early retirement because they were just, you know, it, every, all events lined up. They, they, they decided to take early retirement. Um, and the second problem is due to come back as soon as we get on top, like I said, with our vaccinations and COVID. So I feel like there is strong opportunity in aviation. It is a growing field and it will certainly overcome the COVID um, issues. Um, just to put a bit of perspective from industry on top of this is uh, I just decided to put in some numbers for everybody here um, on what Boeing is predicting. So Boeing expects there will be pilot demand between now and 2039 of about 248,000 in Asia and around 763,000 pilots globally. So that's a huge number. That's a lot of student pilots that we need to cater for this demand. Um, and you can imagine all the all the resources put together how hard it would be to keep these, these number of pilots um, just coming out and, and meeting the demand. So the, the interest, we expect the, the forecast over the next, uh, within the next two years that the domestic markets should recover and about a further two years for the international market to recover as well. So it is a pretty quick uh, time frame if you think about it. And anyone who's thinking of aviation, I would say now is the right time to get training and spend the next two, three years getting your licenses and getting your experience, then you're ready when the job opportunities do come. Thanks very much, um, Vinny. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying is, um, you know, start start your training now and hit the ground running in two years' time when those uh, when those markets recover or when those markets pick up. Um, that's that's a really exciting um, prospect, and um, uh, and those uh, forecast numbers by Boeing are available on the Boeing website. Um, <clears throat> all right, thanks very much. Uh, the next question is um, for you, just um, Jacinta. Um, what uh, sorry? What advice would you give to your younger self? Um, as you start your university journey? Yeah, great question, Paul. And I wish I um, had someone to tell me this when I was younger. Um, firstly, take every step as it comes. It is a journey. Um, it can be quite long at times, but it is a quite a rewarding career. Um, don't give up. Probably the best advice I can give someone. There will be times when things will get tough. Um, it's in any course, really. There will be a time where you just want to give up and you just want to throw the towel in and just walk away. Don't give up because you'll beat yourself up forever about it and you'll be like, why didn't I keep going? Um, so that's probably the biggest advice I could give someone. Um, just keep going no matter what and enjoy it. Um, while you're out solo, enjoy that solo. Um, you know, you're going to keep doing more and more solo. So really, really take in what's coming um, and embrace it because it's a lovely career. That's great. Thanks very much, Jacinta. And uh, Vinny, same question. What advice would you give to your younger self as you start uh, on your university journey? Well, Jacinta set a pretty high benchmark there. Um, now, it is it is actually a really good question to think about it and reflect back when you've um, you know been in the industry for a while. Um, there are a couple of things that I'd like to echo. It's just don't give up. The course is challenging. There is a lot of theory. Um, at times it does get, it's hard to find the motivation, but just don't give up. Um, also, the second thing is to lean on people. There are people all around you. There's support stuff all, at, um, all around you. That's the reason why we have campus life. So make sure when there are people around and you're not 
feeling 100%, just lean on somebody and they will help you out. That's awesome. Okay, thanks very much, um, Vinny. All right, so it looks like we're running a little bit of uh, a little bit ahead of time. So um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience now, and uh, and and then we'll see how we go um, for time. So the first question I'm going to get just into to uh, to answer. This is a question that's come through from our audience. Um, just into, can you comment on your experience as a woman in the aviation industry? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. I'm glad someone has asked this one. Um, it's been challenging. Um, when I first started, I started with a group of six girls. Um, there was no female instructor when I was here either. I, they were all male. Um, through my experience as well, I was the only female to graduate from my class. So there was no other female that graduated with me. Um, upon... Um, progressing in my training as well we have been able to acquire some more female instructors and we're actually able as RMIT able to get our first um, head of operations um, female which is great um, so Julia Lang is our first female head of operations um, really really great to see that diversity um, I wish I would have had more female instructors when I started just to have that diversity like to have that option of you know I want to train with that female I want to you know, have more female diversity. Um, and in Julia's word, even though she is the first, um, she's certainly not the last. So I reckon that's a great quote from her. Thanks very much, um, Jacinta. Um, I'm just going to share with our audience um, a couple of other um, associations with whom we are partnered. Um, and that is, uh, the first one is the AWPA, which is the um, Australian Women's Pilot Association. Um, this was founded in the 1930s by Nancy Bird Walton and the AWPA has grown into an organisation now with the aim of promoting women's involvement in aviation from aero clubs to airlines. Uh, and they offer a range of scholarships and awards each year, in addition to arranging meetings and activities. And of course, if you wanted to find out more about the AWPA, um, you can go and check them out on their uh, website. Uh, one other partnership um, who we have an association with is the WAAA, which is the Women in Aviation Aerospace Australia. Uh, this is an, an initiative to promote the issue of gender diversity and the participation of women in the aviation and aerospace sector in Australia. Uh, it also provides a network for women to connect with industry peers, inspire future generations to join the industry and excel in their chosen careers. And if you wanted to find out more about the WAAA, uh, you can go to their website and uh, I'm sure you can get lots of information. Okay, um, the next question um, from our audience, I'm going to uh, hand over to you, Vinny. We've got a question here. Once I graduate from the course, will I be able to work as a pilot overseas or will I need to do more training? Well, that's a great question. Um, so once you finish the associate degree in RMIT, you are qualified as an Australian pilot. Um, Obviously, there are international standards, so you've got some of them as well. But depending on which country the, the particular individual is looking at, there could be a conversion process you have to go through, and that's independent to each country. And the, you'll find more information through that country's uh, safety manager or the safety organization they have. Um, but we've had people in the past that have finished the training here and they've gone off to other parts of the world to fly. It's truly an international um, qualification. It's just a, a small hurdle around the conversions. That's great. Okay, thanks very much, um, Vinny. Um, another, the next question, actually, I'll stay with you, Vinny, for this one. Um, what's the most surprising aspect of being a pilot and what's the most rewarding? Um, the most surprising aspect? Just from gathering what the students come back and what they say is once you've accomplished the solo flight, some of them do surprise themselves and how they've done that. Um, and it's so early on in the piece, so I guess that's the other 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 part of it. Um, and the most rewarding part, it's depending on different individuals, but sometimes, you know, when you are flying and the sun's setting, just that, that view itself could be quite rewarding. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you realise that you're off track, you're getting lost, and then how you get back on track and you just realise everything and the situation always kicks in 
and when you when you out of that tricky situation, that's also quite rewarding, and the heart beats start settling down again. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Jacinta, same question. Um, uh, what's the most surprising aspect of being a pilot and what's the most rewarding? Ah, uh, such a challenging question. <laughs> um, I mean, most rewarding, um, I mean, everything really. Like, it's it's just amazing that we get to fly aircraft. Um, also now instructing that we get to teach. Um, I honestly think the most rewarding for me is actually seeing someone go solo. That is just absolutely incredible. Seeing their smiles when they come back. Um, I've only just recently been able to send people solo, being a grade two now. Um, so I reckon that's just absolutely awesome. I remember my first solo, I was, you know, scared but happy at the same time. So being able to actually send someone solo on the other end, it feels almost the same. Like you have the same joy um, that you have from actually being solo. Um, most surprising, um, that one's probably more tough, I reckon. <laughs> um, being a pilot, I guess some of the things that you see actually, um, especially on navigation flights, um, you're out there by yourself sometimes. Um, you know, like Vinny said, you can get lost at points, but you always find yourself. Um, I guess the most surprising aspect of being a pilot is how much you do learn being a pilot, um, how much confidence you have in yourself once you do do things well. Um, that's probably the most surprising, I reckon, having ability to trust yourself. Uh, and uh, thanks, Jacinta. And I guess um, what this course uh, aims to achieve, or, or one, a few of the things that you'll get uh, gain from the course, are things like uh, you know um, threat management, uh, decision making, uh, critical um, critical thought. Um, you know, leadership, teamwork, all those sort, sorts of things. So um, have you found any of those, you know, throughout your journey, have you found any of those to be a surprising aspect? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, obviously, when you're just learning to fly, um, you know, you've got your instructor there to help you out. Um, but when you go solo, and especially navigation solo, you don't have them anymore sitting beside you. Um, so making sure that you're looking out, um, you know, everything really, it's just really rewarding and surprising as well, how much you can actually learn about those things. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much, Jacinda, for sharing that with us. Um, Katia, over to you. Um, what do you want to do when you graduate? Uh, there are a lot of options I've considered. I haven't really stuck to one, but I'm definitely looking at the instructor um, course and stream because uh, I just love how the instructors at RMIT teach. It's just also I find it like Jacinta very rewarding. Um, I've considered joining the Defence Force, which is also one option that I'm pretty set on as well. But I'd also love to join the commercial industry and maybe fly commercial jets or even charter jets as well. That sounds like an amazing career. Um, thanks very much, um, Katia. OK, um, we've got some more questions coming through from the audience, so keep them coming. And thanks very much for your questions um, out there and um, out there in audience land. Um, I'm going to ask this one to Vinny. Uh, I'm currently studying year 11. Just wondering if it's worth doing year 12 methods. Yeah, definitely. Um, so anyone who's in year 11 or 12 um, doing any maths and of course the English, which is compulsory, uh, will certainly help your chances in getting selected for the course. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Vinny. Uh, and again, um, Vinny, this is another question for you. Is there anything I can do to help my chances on getting into the QFPP program? Um, so basically that program, once you're in the associate degree, um, you just feel an expression of interest and um, it just takes it from there. So the best thing you can do is to train well, good attendance, always have the good attitude, like you said, Paul, um, and that just betters your chances. You're pretty much into a selection pool and it's really onto Qantas what they do from there. 
Yeah, that's um, uh, that's a really great answer. Thanks for that. And um, like you said, you know, it's still a uh, a recruitment process. So it's you know similar to any other recruitment process. You've got to be the right fit, um, etc. That's that's a recruitment process undertaken by Qantas, not um, RMIT. So it's the same as you know if you're getting a job at uh, Woolworths or any other organisation. Um, uh, you still go through that process, and they, I guess they need to make sure that you've uh, you've got what they want. Um, well, thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to stay with you, Vinny, for the next question. Um, will I be able to visit the campus uh, or the campuses soon? Um, and if yes, uh, once restrictions are lifted, uh, will we be will we be running tours of our Bendigo campus? Yes, yeah, so uh, we are really keen and excited to get everybody onto campus as soon as possible. It's just when the, the government restrictions allow for this. Um, so currently, even though we're under restrictions, some of our final year students are on campus. They've been allowed to train. So yeah, definitely once the campus, uh, once the restrictions are eased, we'll get everybody onto campus that we can. It's a really good point about Bendigo and tours. So we've just recently started out this new initiative um, where we run intensive boot camps. So students from Point Cook, can head up to Bendigo and spend a week at Bendigo where we put them up into accommodation and um, make sure that they get a week's worth of intensive flying uh, at the campus there. Also gives them another experience, another airfield to look at, um, and it just helps the overall picture. Great. Okay, thanks very much, Vinny. Um, uh, let's have uh, a, an answer from um, Jacinta now, this is another question from the audience. Who has inspired you? And they don't necessarily need to be aviation related. Oh, this is such a good question. Um, I really think my family actually inspired me to become a pilot. Um, my dad's a pilot and um, not commercial or anything, he just does charter work. Um, when I was really young, he always had a plane. Um, just a small little plane that we went out and about with. Um, and same with my grandfather. He also um, had like ultralights, so really, really small aircraft. So aviation's really been in my family for a really long time. Um, another thing that has inspired me as well, um, obviously I've got family overseas, so I've obviously wanted to go visit them. Um, as a young child, we always travelled in 747s or A380s, um, and I always thought to myself, yeah, it'd be really cool <laughs> to fly one of these. Um, so that's really what's inspired me, definitely my family, um, making them proud as well, um, obviously with everything too. Thanks very much, um, Jacinta. Wow, 747s, I haven't heard that um, that name for a while. Let's hope they stay around in our skies. It's personally for me, that's my favourite aircraft. I remember um, travelling around in the 80s <laughs> when, uh, when there were lots of them flying around. Um, truly an awesome aircraft. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to ask the same question to Katia now. Uh, Katia, who has inspired you? Um. My family as well as just like Jacinta said, um, I haven't really travelled overseas, but I do have a lot of family overseas as well that I haven't seen at all. So I just always love travel. Um, I I am a swimmer, so I travel a lot interstate um, on planes, and I've just loved it and fell in love with it ever since then. And yeah, just family has motivated me to continue that dream. That's awesome. Thanks very much, Katia. And finally, Vinny. Paul, Who's you inspire me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vinny. Uh, um, no, it's, I've, I've always been quite a cricket fanatic myself. And um, out of all the people that I can draw down on, I look at Steve Waugh, um, ex-captain of Australia, and just the, the, the things he went through and how he led the team and, and his leadership skills keeping a calm head even under a stressful situation, um, all those little things picked off. Excellent, thanks very much, um, Vinny. Okay, uh, another question that's just come through, is RMIT able to make this course more affordable uh, and do you offer scholarships? Um, let's uh, go to you, back, back to you, sorry, Vinny. Sure. Um, I would love to make this course as affordable as possible, but unfortunately, at the end of the day, um, aircrafts are expensive, the fuel that goes into it is expensive, having the instructors there, um, it all adds up, and that's where that cost really comes from. But fortunately, you know, the 
the whole program is uh, you can go through a, a government loan and get fee help, um, which is a great um, way to get the training done. Um, in terms of getting, sorry, what was the second part of the question? uh what oh sorry oh scholarships um, yeah. yeah do you offer scholarships thank you sorry, yeah um we do have scholarships so we've got um three scholarships at the moment in the associate degree and they're all to students who are in their final year and have demonstrated some really good academic um progress throughout the program so when you get to that point it is a possibility that you could have this scholarship okay thanks very much um uh, great answer Okay, the next question uh, from the audience is the QFPP available to um, sorry, is the QFPP available to international students? Um, I might answer that myself. Um, so yes, the QFPP is available to all students. Um, however, in order to receive a, um, a an accepted job offer, should they, um, should one be become available at the end of the um, three phase process, they do have a set of um, uh, uh, criteria um, which need to be met and of course um, one of them is to be um, uh, graduated from the associate degree. Uh, another one uh, and importantly um, is to make sure that you have un uh, unrestricted working rights in Australia. Um, so that's a fairly important one. Um, all of those um, set, uh, all of those criteria, QFPP criteria, are available on the Qantas Careers website, um, uh, which you can find through the RMIT Associate Degree uh, in Aviation website as well. That's a great question. All right, uh, next question. Uh, <laughs> This is a good one. Another one from the audience is, is the saying, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going, true or just an advertising slogan? <laughs> uh, Vinny, I'll uh, hand that over to you. Tricky. Uh, I myself love Boeing, but I'm also an Airbus fan, so I think <laughs> quite neutral here. Um, there isn't really much in terms of the safety standards or the comfort of the aircraft. There isn't much um, that differentiates them. Very similar aircraft. However, at the end of the day, as a pilot, uh, Boeing aircraft tends to be a bit more enjoyable. They, the pilots have a bit more control and say, whereas Airbus tries to automate a lot more than Boeing. But as I said, there's not much between the two aircrafts. Okay, I think um, yeah, my um, my favourite aircraft is also uh, Boeing. So I'm hoping, personally, I'm hoping that they stay around. Uh, and if they are, I'm I'm definitely. Um, I'm definitely going on a Boeing, if that makes sense. Uh, all right, thanks very much, Vinny, for uh, for that answer. Um, okay, final question, um, and this one I will um, hand over to uh, you, Jacinta, and I might get Vinny to answer um, as well. Uh, but firstly, for you, Jacinta, um, why choose RMIT? Yeah, great, great option. Um, and question. Uh, obviously, we do have a few training schools here in Melbourne. Um, RIT really, really sets apart by having great campus locations. Um, so especially here in Point Cook, we have exclusive use to the campus um, compared to Moorabbin, where there is quite a lot of aircraft there. Um, in my journey to actually choose RMIT, I actually got out a piece of paper, laid it all out, my options. That was actually one of the biggest selling points for me here at RMIT. Less time, on the ground, more time in the air. Um, another one is industry connections. So we've also got a lot of industry connections here at RMIT, obviously with the Qantas Future Pilot Program. Um, and obviously uh, um, RMIT alumni as well. There's heaps of students out there that have got jobs in the industry um, that you can talk to as well. Um, we also have opportunity to spend time in the CBD. Um, so by doing that, um, some of our theory classes are delivered in the city. Um, as a student, I always loved having that day in the city, getting to experience that um, city life, so to speak. I was a country girl born and raised in New South Wales, so I didn't have much experience with the city. Um, by having both, Point Cook here um, is quite, you know, small, um, not big city or anything like that. Um, and then having that city as well, it's a great contrast. Um, also Bendigo as well, they also have city days. Um, so obviously they're in the country, they get that kind of side to them, and then also being able to travel to the city. So it's very, very versatile. We've got two great um, campus locations here in Melbourne. 
Thanks very much, um, Jacinta. Um, Vinny, do you have anything to add to that? Um, that's a pretty good list, there, Jacinta, but I guess the other things you could add to that is um, Aramot is one of the very few universities that owns its own flying school, and that's a really big point. So a lot of other universities or other organizations that offer flight training will, will outsource the flight training, whereas RMIT owns and operates its own aircraft. It, um, it has its own air operator certificate, so that's great. Also, um, it's all about the student experience from day one with RMIT. So anything that RMIT can do to help the student experience, we, we try to do that. Um, and you're really well looked after with all the facilities and the amenities and, of course, the city life. Um, a day of that, a week doesn't hurt anyone. Um, so all in all, it's a really nice round package to go through RMIT. Uh, that's awesome. Um, thanks very much, Vinny. Um, Katia, um, if you could just, um, we've only got a couple of minutes to go, if you could briefly share with us, uh, I guess you've recently gone through this process of having to choose a training provider. Why RMIT? Um, just the um, going to the open days, they just sort of gave me options that other flight training schools didn't and I really like the location and getting more time to spend in the air than on the ground and also it was very close to home which was great. That's great. Thanks. Um, thanks so much. Um, and uh, yeah, our, our open days are awesome. Um, you get right up close to the aircraft to touch them and feel them and ask instructors lots of questions, lots, all the silly questions which you're always um, scared to, to ask. Um, OK, well, thanks very much for that. Um, that's uh, just about all we've got um, time for today. So. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, remember to check out the other live sessions in our Open Day platform and do register for the main online event, um, the, the main Open Day event, which is on Sunday, August the 29th. And we hope to welcome you to RMIT soon. Thanks very much.